Hello everyone, I am Kate Thompson from NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries for Capitol Hill Ocean Talk. We're broadcasting live from Chow 2015 here right here at the museum in Washington, D.C. And I wanted to give a final shout out to one of our pin sites at the Thunder Bay Great Lakes Maritime Heritage Center in Alpena, Michigan. Here's your second to last chance to be part of our conversation and tweet us questions at hashtag Chow 2015 or chat us at OceansLive.org. Chow just finished its panel on the wave of the future. What do the youth of America think? Coincidentally, you might see a few familiar faces and a few new ones joining me in the studio right now to discuss the role of women leaders and millennials more broadly in ocean stewardship. With us today, we have Monica Medina, the Senior Director of International Ocean Policy at the National Geographic Society. Previously, Monica served as the Special Assistant to the Secretary of Defense and as the Principal Deputy Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere at NOAA. Next, we have Daniela Fernandez, President and Founder of the Georgetown Sustainable Oceans Alliance. Daniela is a senior at Georgetown University studying government and economics, and she currently interns with the Impact Investing Team at the Case Foundation. And last, but certainly not least, and also Great Lakes Maritime Heritage Center, it's your lady. It's Hannah McDonald, a volunteer at the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary serving as a sanctuary representative and ambassador. She even developed plastics, F-L-O-A-T, or float at the sanctuary, a grassroots effort to reduce plastics pollution in Alpena, Michigan. In 2013, Hannah was one of only 15 North American high school students selected to participate in the competitive Ocean for Life program, which we will introduce later. Ladies, thank you so much for joining me here in our studio today. Great and to be great here. job up there, yeah. ladies, that you just <laughs> did. Uh, it's it's oh, really, great. really cool to have seen some of the great questions that you were asking and answering up there. So, Monica, as a strong example of a woman leading the way in ocean stewardship, can you tell us about what brought you to the ocean and some career highlights that you can share with us? Oh, gosh, it's been an incredible career in um, oceans and working at NOAA in particular. I've been at NOAA twice in my career, first as general counsel in the Clinton administration and then as the principal deputy undersecretary for the Obama administration. And that's been such a privilege. And I've had the chance to work with such incredible women scientists mm -hmm. there from Dr. Sylvia Earle, who of course inspired so many women to be um, ocean champions. And then Dr. Jane Lubchenco and Dr. Kathy Sullivan. It's been just a privilege to be um, someone standing beside them shoulder to shoulder and, and advocating for greater ocean conservation. And I'll, you know, I'll take away from my first time in um, NOAA, a, a National Ocean Conference in 1998 with the President Cl Clinton, Vice President uh, Gore, and First Lady Hillary Clinton, where they came together on the shores of Monterey Bay and we talked for the first time about the need for a national ocean policy and really to integrate all of the different themes and strands of ocean policy and ocean life um, from the commercial to the defense to science. Um, that was a real highlight when the president, the the Vice President and the First Lady all mm -hmm. came out to California mm -hmm. to talk about the importance of oceans. I'll mm -hmm. never forget that day. And it spurned a lot of um, ocean legislation and I think uh, ocean interest. And then to come to the Obama administration and to deal with sort of the worst of times, the, the Gulf of um, you know, oil spill and the you know, incredible um, tragedy that was the loss of ocean life there and the importance of the government stepping in and doing everything it could to try to protect the resources and to protect um, people from eating uh, seafood that was um, that potentially was contaminated by the oil so uh, that those were you know kind of bookends of my career in, at least at NOAA and then now at National Geographic working on the pristine seas program and with a bunch of emerging explorers who are pushing the boundaries of ocean conservation. Um, we have a young woman here this week. It's our Explorers Week. And so all our um, young scientists and explorers are here in Washington. And Jess Cramp is one who's working on shark conservation in Fiji. So I, you know, I think it's these young women that really mm -hmm. excite me now um, to see their passion and their desire to make, di make a difference. Well, as you mentioned earlier, Dr. Sylvia Earle, obviously, a trendsetter. She yes. she broke through the ice for for women in in, o in ocean conservation work for sure. She was with us at the gala. She got up there and talked about how 
She influenced the president's decision to create the Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument. You know, at the time, one of the largest, or I think it might have been the largest marine protected area mm -hmm. in the world. I mean, to just think that she made that influence is, is pretty pretty impressive. And she also worked at NOAA. So I think, you know, NOAA as an agency is, is doing a really good job in ensuring that women, uh, you know, have a pathway to become leaders in both the ocean and also for weather and other things that, that NOAA does. And so... Uh, but you mentioned specifically one of your programs, the Emergency, Emerging Explorers Program, and there's, there's a ton of women that have come up through, through that program in particular. But, you know, coincidentally, it happens to be the Explorers Week. You know, what happens during Explorers Week for these new emerging explorers? Uh, it's great that you're willing to, you're able to highlight them. Um, they're an amazing group of young scientists and um, they come to Washington, D.C., and they uh, hear e about what each other is doing. They don't know each other in advance. They're selected um, by National Geographic for their excellence, and um, they come to D.C., and they hear lectures from each other and from our current explorers and residents. So it's a chance for them to meet a Sylvia Earle mm -hmm. or a Bob Ballard and hear about the work that they're doing. And there's just an amazing synergy when you get that many smart, interesting um, really exciting people in the in a, in a room together. So we have lectures and we have events where uh, we do some um, shooting of them in you know camera, mm -hmm. uh, getting them ready for magazine stories or on social media. So it's a it's a huge um, event for National Geographic. It's a great week and it's been streamed live. Um, many of the lectures have been live online for the first time this year. Oh, so it's great. 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 It's great. Great. So, Daniela, uh, as an upper class woman at Georgetown <laughs> University, you have some pretty impressive credentials. I wasn't anywhere near what you had when I was a junior <laughs> in college. Can you tell us about your interest in marine affairs, the Georgetown Sustainable Oceans Alliance, and why you founded it? Yeah, most definitely. So I think my interest in environmental affairs started back in high school through my environmental science class, and which is why I'm so passionate about education now, because I think reaching students very uh, early on will make a huge difference. But I think my, um, my ocean interest really emerged from um, a meeting at the UN. So I was invited by Georgetown to attend a UN session on oceans. And the session was focused around uh, marine protect protected areas. And I was surrounded by ambassadors. I was surrounded by science. I was surrounded by every policymaker from around the world. And I looked around me, and I was the only young person in the room. Mm -hmm. I, I was honored to be invited. But at the same time, I was very disappointed to see that the word wasn't getting out. And most importantly, it was fear and uh, a sense of responsibility that led me to leave that meeting that day and feel like I had to do something about the information I received. I felt like, for example, a statistic that I remember is by 2050, we won't have any more fish in the ocean. Um, and it's staggering to think that by the time my kids are 25, they won't have a marine life. Um, so with that information, I felt that I needed to engage my generation, that I needed to raise awareness in one way or another. So I came back on the, um, on the train ride back from the UN meeting. I had this vision of having some type of um, platform of engaging youth, of bringing together world leaders um, from the science, policy, and business uh, um, perspective and bringing them together with millennials and helping them understand so what are the issues, where are there opportunities for growth, and how can you make a change? Um, so again, this was just a vision, this was just a crazy idea I had. And when I went back to Georgetown, everyone I talked to was like, oh, you're, you're crazy. You want to bring Bill Clinton, you want to bring Sylvia Earle, you want to bring Gary Nell. And I believe that we had to do it. It wasn't an option. And actually, that's how I met Monica. Um, and she's become uh, my mentor uh, since then. Very which I'm very, nice. very uh, yeah. honored to, to have her. Um, so I went back to Georgetown and founded the Sustainable Oceans Alliance, which is an organization focusing around empowering millennials and empowering youth in bringing solutions to their problems and more importantly just connecting them to opportunities. Because I've been to a lot of these events and meetings now, but I, I still feel like I'm one of the only young faces, and for mm -hmm. exception for today, which I'm very grateful for Chow for having this session. I think it's the tides are, are, are turning and they're changing the way that we engage the youth. Yeah. Um, just recently, last week, I was invited to the Economist World Ocean Summit. And again, I was the only young person in the room. <laughs> However, um, they graciously invited me and uh, will we'll, we'll work with me further to get more millennials to attend future events. And that's how the Sustainable Oceans Alliance was started. Very exciting. Part of your mission to protect our ocean is to mobilize support against the millennial, uh, amongst the millennial mm -hmm. generation. 
Um, and, and for those who don't know, millennials were born between 1979 and 2000. Um, but at times, millennials at, millennials at large have been called an apathetic or entitled generation. Uh, do you agree or disagree with these stereotypes? I completely disagree. Um, there is no way we are apathetic or, or ignorant about the issues. M more than anything, we are very passionate about sustainability. I think the, the difference in understanding comes from whereas previous generations saw uh, the bottom line, which is profit and sustainability as a side thing that you have to do to uh, have a marketing campaign. We see sustainability as um, a need, an avenue for us to impact change. So I think that now, and you can see more and more different entrepreneurship events and um, businesses that have started that are really focused around um, empowering people and themselves and also empowering uh, businesses and policymakers. Uh, to engage youth and to help us make a difference. So I would definitely not call that pathetic in any way. Yeah, well, the one thing about millennials is I know for sure and a fact, I mean, we're in this technological you know, revolution of things when it comes to uh, their phones, iPads, you know, whatever. So uh, millennials, I think, are the ones that are taking to not the airwaves, but I don't know what it would be called, tech waves, <laughs> to, to say what they want to say and to tell people, this is what we need to do. That's what I think is pretty amazing about millennials and why we need to engage millennials is because they're tech savvy. You are tech savvy. Definitely. And uh, it's, it's pretty awesome because you're connected. You connect all your networks, your friends, uh, everybody uh, with social media. And, and I think that that's, that's one way, we, or another reason why we need to connect more with you is because you get it, you get it. So Hannah is certainly an example of an active, involved millennial, as Danielle has, has talked about. And the other thing that connects you to Monica is you were part of the Ocean for Life program. And the Ocean for Life program is an impressive program that the, National Marine, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries runs. Uh, uh, and we do it every, every other year, dependent upon being able to get funding from outside funders. But it started as a program with National Geographic, where uh, back in uh, 2000, we wanted to bring students and teachers to sanctuaries to be immersed in a place and get a sense of place. And so the program was started, and, and we were actually in 2001, right before September 11th, we were taking uh, students and teachers to the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. And the Channel Island, and it was, they actually, a uh, set of teachers and actually people from National Ge Geographic mm -hmm. were on the plane that, that hit the Pentagon. So yes. we were a couple years later inspired and picking up the pieces actually from the program and we really wanted to say hey what, what can we do? What can we do because there seemed to be this feeling in the country of you know scared and you know that we were under attack and and that's not the case and there's one thing in the United States that really shares everything or connects us all and that is the ocean it is one ocean and it's inter interconnected and we felt like we need to take the ocean for life program and make it a positive program to say let's bring these people from other cultures from the Middle East and connect them with students from the United States to not only share their culture and you know how they were raised what what was important to them but also how they're connected through the ocean and so we created the ocean for life program and we've done i think four or five now and a cool component of that program is actually a media program part where the kids the students take and they make videos of their experience they do photos of their experience and it was part of the photo camp through mm -hmm. national geographic yep. uh, so it was it's a really, really impressive program that Hannah, actually, you were chosen for, and it was a competitive application process, and here you are from Thunder Bay in Michigan, and yeah. you got chosen to be part of the Ocean for Life program. Can you, you know, I mean, you're a volunteer at Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. You've done some really amazing stuff in that community up there. Can you tell us a little bit about your path and what the Ocean for Life program did for you? Yeah, so I started off loving Lake Huron and swimming and snorkeling and sailing on Lake Huron, so that made me become passionate about the water. I became a scuba diver, then a volunteer at the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, as well as a student in the Shipwreck Alley class, which is a place-based education class. So I really got involved through that and then found out about Ocean for Life. So Ocean for Life was like the 
first time that I actually was like submerged in ocean science and got to experience the beauty of the ocean and the conservation efforts that were being taken place. And also, since I came from a small town in northern Michigan, the first time that I got to meet people from different cultures. So the cultural understanding part was very awesome for me. And Ocean for Life also started an action plan for me, which we had to kind of brainstorm while we were there. And I brainstormed about marine debris because it was something that was happening in the Great Lakes as well. So it was something that I could take home and also connect to the ocean. So I started the Plastics Float program, which you talked about briefly. Float stands for for the love of Alpena today. Uh -huh. And Alpena is the hometown. Yep. So we do plastic pollution awareness events. We talked to junior high students, high school students, as well as the Association of Lifelong Learner Students. And we try to just get the word out about plastic pollution and how bad single-use plastics are. Pretty impressive. Can you tell us some of the friends that you made on that trip? Of course. So I have 15 friends from the Middle East that I still get to keep in touch with because of social media. And I have 15 friends from the US as well that I still get to keep in touch with. We're all almost in college or making our way to college. And it's great to see that the students that I went to Ocean for Life with are pursuing environmental studies and marine biology and economics and policy. We're all just going to work together and make a difference. And I know for a fact that I'm going to be able to work with them again one day in the future just because of how passionate Ocean for Life made us all. Well, we have a great question from our online audience. What can students do to help our ocean and Great Lakes? So why don't we start with Danielle, what do you think? Sure, so I think they need to start a State of Oceans Alliance chapter. <laughs> and this is, yes. um, we are starting to grow our, our base. We currently have about seven universities who have um, chapters, which means that they will be educating their peers, they will be bringing speakers on campus. Um, so I think raising awareness is, is, is a term that's thrown a lot, around a lot, but I think the fundamental problem is that students are not exposed to the ocean as much as they are to climate change per se. So I think bringing, bringing together um, different speakers, or speakers and role models to uh, the campus and then helping students understand how they can really make a difference in their careers, whether it's going into policy, science, um, banking, uh, whatever the case may be, understanding how they can get involved and also opening up opportunities uh, with different networks of in, in the marine area. Nice. Hannah, do you have anything? I think to get involved with programs like Ocean for Life and get involved with volunteering would be a great thing. There are programs out there for youth. They just need to be talked about and known about. So Ocean for Life was it for me, and I'm sure it could be for many other students. Monica? I would say, and I, I will give credit to Daniela, when we were working to get the president to expand the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument, we needed a, a, to be able to tap into a lot of people who would care about ocean conservation because those islands are so far away from the continental United, United States. And we tapped into this network that Daniela started. And I mean, that's the thing about millennials and young people. They're so connected and they then can talk about these issues on social media. They can tweet, they can comment to the government. They can show their support for oceans in ways that we never could. You don't have to write a long letter and send it to some mysterious post office box. You can tweet, you can text, you can send your, you can make your support for those kinds of conservation initiatives that the government is doing. You can make it known and that, it was really meaningful. It made a difference in that particular um, effort and the president did and made this enormous monument yeah. for all of us to enjoy yeah. for you know generations. That's great. Well, so speaking of our iPhones, iPads, well, I'm going to take a selfie. <laughs> Is that okay? Sure. Because I am so lucky to be next to both all, all of you. Uh, and I think we should tweet this out. What do you think? Yeah, Absolutely. Okay, so here we go. Let's you got to share the picture, then we can all tweet yes, it. Yes, we're going to tweet it out. Let's see if we can get it in here. Can we get it? Got, got it. it. Okay. Click. Yay! All right. <laughs> Selfie going out to everybody. Hashtag it for us, please. Ciao 2015. But uh, so I wanted to just quickly touch on this because of the world and the media often reports on the ma marginalization of women in the workplace. Um, or the exceptional successes of females like Sylvia Earle or Yahoo CEO Marissa Mayer or even Taylor Swift, for example. I mean, sure. she's made a huge impact. 
Um, how can women at any age overcome the stigma uh, or inferiority or conversely the fear of failing to achieve great expectations? Because we, we know we've all been there at, at one time or another to the best position themselves for their own personal success. Um, or in other words, what, you know, what advice do you give uh, to have young girls, young women, keep going, keep going forward. As you know, my mother used to say to me with every path on the road that I felt challenged and felt like I couldn't move forward, she'd say, you know, honey, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. And it, it, it has been. And, and each way I looked at my mother as my, my strength and my example of how to move forward. So, so what, is, what are some of your thoughts on that? Monica? I think that um, speaking up, you know, using your voice, the power of women's voices, especially when we all stand together. I mean, I'll never forget sitting in the NOAA leadership um, room the first time we all got together, and it was myself and Dr. Lubchenco as the two senior leaders, and our civilian leader was a woman, and the chief of staff was a woman. We looked around the table, and we were running an agency, a $5 billion agency. It was five women. It was great. And there can be a lot more of that. I am convinced that there are a lot more women who are capable. And I'm sure that these two are going <laughs> to lead the way. So it's great. Yeah. I, I would say two things. One would be dream big. I don't think uh, there are any limits uh, to anything you can achieve. I mean, my, my own story is, is a great um, example. I came from a single uh, mother household. I dealt with a lot of um, migration pro uh, process to get my permanent residency. Didn't imagine I would end up at Georgetown University. Um, and now, I mean, sitting here with, with incredible women uh, like Monica, I mean, it's honestly something that I never imagined. So I would definitely encourage young girls to, to dream and to, and to persevere and to write down their goals and their aspirations and to place them on the wall and to, and to uh, wake up and look at them every morning. Um, the second thing I would say is reach out to, to your role models. Reach out to the women that you want to uh, be like. Uh, ask them for coffee, send them a meeting note. It doesn't matter what the way you reach out to. Um, they'll be more than happy to, to mentor you and to um, help you out. Hannah. And I have to say is just be passionate and follow your dreams. Also agree with Daniela in choosing a mentor. It's very important to have someone to look up to like that. And if you're ever down, you just look to them and they'll lead you the right way. Can I say one more thing? I just want to give a shout out to all the young women at, who work in NOAA. They're just a, an incredibly talented pool. I was always impressed with the young women scientists who were supporting us in the executive offices and who were working so hard in the field. I, I, you know, I, I really admire all of them. I think they're going to be a great legacy for Dr. Lubchenco, for Dr. Earl. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's wonderful. So thanks to all the young women of NOAA who are working so hard. Agreed, completely. Thank you, Kate. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you, ladies, for being on my panel today and discussing this great topic. Uh, I can't think of a more thoughtful and inspiring session to end our week at Capitol Hill Ocean Talk. I want to thank you, ladies, again, for sharing your personal experiences and advice for today's and tomorrow's women commanding the ocean conservation movement. So Chow concludes with the Leadership Roundtable at 3 p.m. and closing remarks beginning at 4.30 p.m. I just want to give a quick shout out one more time to the Great Lakes Maritime Heritage Center in Thunder Bay. Uh, it, and uh, thanks, Hannah, for sending Hannah up to us and uh, to, to do this great conversation. And also a shout out to Mystic Aquarium, who was also another pin site for us this week. It was a pleasure to join you this week on Oceans Live. I hope you found the three days of discussion fascinating and a platform for ocean policy going forward. The National Marine Sanctuary Foundation and its partners brought the oceans experts and most influential to Washington, D.C. for the purpose of starting a dialogue that can swell into a wave of action for the nation. Visit OceansLive.org throughout the year for the Chow 2015 video gallery and future live programming broadcasts from above and sometimes below our ocean, our 13 National Marine Sanctuaries, and anywhere else that Call of the Ocean has something important for us to hear. For the last time from Capitol Hill Ocean Week 2015, I'm your host for Capitol Hill Ocean Talk, Kate Thompson. Thank you for watching.